The book of Acts, brethren, as we speak about the book of Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. Now, I wonder how many of us, including myself, brethren, I'm not excluded from that, how many of us could name all the twelve apostles from the Bible? And yet, we are supposed to be the, the ones who continue the works of the apostles. So, let me give you the alphabetical list of the apostles, and let me just clarify one important thing about that. Alphabetical list of the apostles, the first one will be Andrew. After him will be Bartholomew, who is the same as Nathanael. Third one will be James, who is called the Less, James the Less, son of Alphaeus. And there is also another James, the fourth one, James, who was called Bonagre, uh, the son of thunder by Christ, the son of the Zabedee. Zab Zabedee. The fifth will be John, his brother, also called son of thunder by Christ, the son of Zabedee. The sixth one will be Judas Iscariot, who was re later replaced with Matthias. The seventh was Judas, who is the same as Thaddeus, or Le 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 Labius, the brother of James, son of Alphaeus. The eighth on the list will be Matthew, who is also called Levi, and you know we have the Gospel of Matthew. The ninth one will be Philip. The tenth one will be Simon Peter, who is the same as Cephas or Bar Jonah. Eleventh was Simon the Canaanite, who is the same as Simon the Zealot. And twelve will be Thomas, the doubtful Thomas, who is the same as Didymus. Now I've sent you, uh, not to all of you, I guess by email, but I've sent to the forum and even to this group, Skype group, the list of these apostles. It will be good for us to review it from time to time and one of these days hopefully memorize all these 12, the 12 original ones. Later on, as you know, there were others who were not original apostles, like the Apostle Paul. However, many of the apostles, as you have noticed, brethren, had more than one name, and the account in Acts differs from the Gospel accounts because Judas, the brother of James, was also called Thaddeus in two Gospels. Also, Simon the Zealot was called Simon the Cananean in the same two Gospels. So that might be confusing, but uh, that's why I wanted to mention this, and I wanted to clarify that possible confusion. Now, when we talk about the, the Acts, brethren, we need to have some context. Always you remember that I always mention context and uh, sometimes we need to have context, context in order to understand the purpose, the reason, uh, the conditions, the overall, uh, the overall motivation of something that was written. Because the Word of God is inspired by God and uh, therefore Whatever is written in that word, in that word, is not there for no purpose. It has a purpose. So it's uh, you know it, it, the uh, the title of this book is the Acts of the Apostles. But you know, title of the book can be misleading. Why? Well, because the preaching journeys and adventures of ten apostles are bypassed. And brethren, there is a good reason for that. I mentioned that many times, I guess. But do not get weary of me repeating certain things, brethren. We don't see any records about the activity of the Ten Apostles for the simple reason because those Ten Apostles were sent to the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. At that time, in the first century, it was not yet to be revealed where those Ten Tribes had gone. In our time, in our time, in our age, it is given now to us in this end time to understand the location of the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. That's why we know who they are. And how much we need to know who they are was shown very clearly to me and to some of you last during the uh, during our last weekly Bible study. We have realized that we have to sharpen our focus and knowledge about the ten lost tribes, and by extension, we'll also sharpen our focus about the ten apostles. We will, at the end, hopefully, of these of these, when we finish analyzing and going through the Book of Acts, we will hopefully. Also, I'm planning that we can just uh, remind ourselves, if we already know or learn, if we don't know, where did the 12 or the 10 apostles go. So anyway, the preaching journeys adventures of the 10 are bypassed. Now, significant acts of preachers of less importance are included in the book of Acts. So the title more properly should be Acts of Apostolic Men, because primarily the book is the Acts of Peter and Paul. Now, the very book of Acts is split, brethren, in two parts. 
The first part runs from chapter 1 through chapter 15. It is the expansion of the gospel and acceptance of the Gentiles, and Peter is the main focus. I'll remind you that in chapter 10, for example, you remember, the first Gentile to be converted was Cornelius, Cornelius with his house. So basically, the door was open now for the non-Jews, the Gentiles, to come in. And Peter was the one, as you remember, Peter was the one with six other Jews who went there and witnessed that amazing event, which basically was a copy of what happened in Jerusalem. That's why you have people who were speaking in tongues at that time, even before they were immersed, so that the Jews who were there could see that the same spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, was now given to the non-Jews. So it wasn't exclusively for the Jews, now it was for the non-Jews as well. So the first part of the book of Acts is until chapter 15. The second part starts in chapter 15, verse 35, because from, you know, Acts 15, verse 35, we have actually the expansion of the gospel to imperial Rome. <coughs> and Paul, of course, is the main focus. Now, to those of you in Serbia, we have been running now through the, uh, this is the second Sabbath that we talked about, the Apostle Peter, who was never, he was never the uh, first Roman Pope. We have today, we have outlined 10 simple Bible proofs, even without the secular sources. So anyway, so the Apostle Paul was the one who brought the, the gospel to Imperial Rome. Now reason for the name is that the book is primarily, brethren, a history. The reason why these two men are featured so much might be stated as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, there is properly no history only biography. End of the quote. What about the author of the book? Well, almost all commentaries, commentators would agree that the author is Luke. Interestingly enough, if you see in Acts 1.1, 1, 1, in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, I'm so used to this electronic Bible that now turning into this physical becomes interesting obstacle. You see, <laughs> each time has got its own burden, as we say in Serbian. So our burden is we got so many electronic stuff that, you know, the physical stuff becomes uh, slippery, so to speak. Acts 1.1, 1, 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Former treaties, we brethren see. The former account, former treaties. So whoever wrote Acts also wrote a former account. However, we see also in this verse, former treatise, O Theophilus. And if we continue reading, it says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, you see, brethren, it's always consistent. It's always the kingdom of God. Even after his resurrection, Jesus Christ didn't speak about himself and his person. He was speaking about the kingdom of God, expounding to them what does it mean and what would it imply when the kingdom of God comes to this earth. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. So basically, in these four verses, Luke wrote for Theophilus. Now, who was Theophilus? Theophilus, basically, it is brethren uncertain. The name itself means friend in Greek, friend of God or lover of God. So, you know, this Theophilus, to whom Luke is addressing his acts, his writings, could be actually a generic term for all Christian readers who thought they were the friend of God or who loved God. Now, keep in mind that often books intended for the general public were dedicated to friend or patron who contributed to the cost of publishing it. But also, you know, there is another possibility. That Theophilus could have been a Roman official. Now, in his, in his gospel, Luke addresses the same person with the title Kratiste in, basically, uh, in, uh, in Greek, which means most, most excellent. The first verse of the Gospel of Luke, Brethren says, and interestingly again, because Luke was writing to the Gentile audience. He is a non-Hebrew, he was a non-Jewish person, Brethren. 
So he's writing to the Gentile audience, and as he writes to the Gentile audience, he has got some things in there that you don't find in other Gospels. For example, just to give you a quick example, in Luke chapter 12, verse 40, 44, you'll find the the three basic divisions of the Old Testament books. And you find that account only in Luke's Gospel. It was not necessary for Matthew, nor Mark, nor John to write that because they were writing for the Jewish audience. The Jewish people have always known that the book, there's a tripartite division of the Old Testament books. Basically the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, or the Writings, or the Wisdom. Anyway, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Verse 1, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those was from the beginning where eyewitnesses and ministers of the world delivered to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, well, brethren, uh, underline this orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, most excellent Kratiste, you'll find the same title used uh, for people who are of conspicuous rank. You'll find it in Acts chapter 23, for example, verse 26, and also for Festus in Acts chapter 26 and verse 25. So now what we have read in the Gospel of Luke, well, this could be a specific Roman official who was being instructed in preparation for baptism. And Kratiste can also be a friendly greeting nothing more than that so theophilus could have been a hostile perhaps also roman official well could theophilus been could have been could he have been a roman court official who had heard vague or hostile reports of christianity as a subversive troublesome movement and luke sets out to crack this yes brethren possibly it has been also suggested that luke and acts are trial documents directed to an officer of the court and it is in defense of Paul and Christianity, because much of Acts deals with showing that Christianity is not a threat to Rome. Now, what we know of Luke? Well, Luke is mentioned in, you know, by name, three times in the Bible. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul writes in the closing comments of Colossians, Luke and Demas greet you. He also, when he was on trial in Rome, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, says, Only Luke is with me. Luke is also mentioned in the book of Philemon, in verse 24. He's mentioned as Lucas, a fellow laborer. And what is interesting about Luke is that all of the times he was by Paul while Paul was in prison. So faithfulness, loyalty, is such a wonderful trait that we can see in Luke. As I mentioned a couple of hours earlier, brethren, I hope, I would hope, I would hope that we as individual followers of Christ would have this loyalty and faithfulness as our own characteristic. Because, brethren, I, again, I'll have to bring your attention to the verse in the bible which scares me more than anything else it's not about the great tribulation it's not about the state of the world it is the verse when it says as the lawlessness will increase the love of many in some translation says even most the love of most will wax or grow cold brethren and i could notice i could notice by the lack of loyalty by the lack of uh, confidence that people or brethren have one in another I could you could see very easily how the love is waxing cold brethren I would hope that we will have confidence one in another not because we are perfect not because we we do everything perfectly but because we don't doubt one another we don't impute motives to one another brethren so loyalty and faithfulness if we want to look look up a person in the Bible who is an epitome of loyalty and faithfulness, Luke is the one to look, look into. Well, Luke was a Gentile. 
because in Colossians chapter 4 and then in verses 10 through 14 you've got several names mentioned and the book of Colossians of course is written to a Gentile congregation so he's mentioned among those who are not of the circumcision and as I said, he's the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament scriptures. Some scholars think that he may have been a freed man. Because, why do they think so? Well, because in Philemon, names with contractions ending in, in us, like Lucas, were particularly common among slaves. So in Philemon, you know, in verse 24, you find Lucas, a fellow laborer. Now, Greek and Roman masters often educated slaves as physicians because Loka is mentioned as a beloved physician in the Bible. So, Greek and Roman masters often educated slaves as physicians and later freed them for their services. Now, there is also a romantic tradition of Luke and Theophilus. And the romantic tradition says that Luke was the slave and doctor of Theophilus who became gravely ill so Luke's skill and devotion brought him back to health. And in gratitude, Theophilus gave Luke his freedom. And Luke, to show his gratitude, give, gave Theophilus what was the most precious thing he had, the story of Christ and his church. Beautiful tradition, brethren. Whether it's true or not, we don't know. But that's a romantic tradition. Now Luke was a physician. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Beloved physician, in fact. Well, how can he not be a beloved physician? <laughs> you know, when you're ill, the only... There is only one desire that you have to become, to be restored. That's why also we consider our Dr. Thiel to be a beloved Dr. Thiel, beloved overseer of God's flock. Yes, he's, brethren, a natural physician. He has helped numerous people around the world, not only by preaching the gospel. Thousands of people, of course, are receiving a healing message, so to speak, of the gospel, the healing message of hope. But he also began to natural medicine. I'm not sure if many of you know that. He didn't really broadcast that much. I'm, I'm one of those rare ones who got to know that before many of you. He has brought health and restoration to many, many people. 90 plus percent of his cases ended up well. And with complete restoration and health. Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 14 we read. We read that Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. All right. So he was a physician, in fact, the beloved physician. Now, Barclay writes in his commentary, The Acts of the Apostles, he writes the following, We could have guessed that Luke was a doctor because of his instinctive use of medical words. In Luke chapter 4, verse 35, in telling of the man who had the spirit of an unclean devil, he says, When the devil had thrown him down, and uses the correct medical word for convulsions. In Luke chapter 9, verse 38, when he draws the picture of the man who asked Jesus, I beg you to look upon my son, he employs the conventional word for a doctor paying a visit to a patient. The most interesting example is in the saying about the camel and the needle's eye. <laughs> we all know that story, don't we? All three synoptic writers give us that saying. We read that in Matthew 19.24, in Mark 10.25, and Luke 18.25. For needle, both Mark and Matthew use the Greek raphis, the ordinary word for a tailor's or a household needle. Luke alone uses the word belone, the technical word for a surgeon's needle. Luke was a doctor, and a doctor's word came most naturally to his pen. This is Barclay's commentary, brethren. Very adequate indeed. So, no wonder Luke was a beloved physician. He was possibly born in Antioch. Now, you'll remember when I mentioned in a passing comment that after Jerusalem, Antioch was the main brethren center of the true Christianity. And many scholars feel that Luke was probably born in Antioch of a Macedonian family. Now that is very interesting because you remember after that vision in Acts, the Apostle Paul went from Asia, traveled over to Macedonia, which is Europe, and then in 53 AD, the gospel of the kingdom of God was now spreading over Europe. So many scholars feel that probably Luke was born in Antioch of a Macedonian family. In Acts chapter 6, in verse 5, 
Luke seems to show a special interest in Antioch. By reading that, brethren, I didn't really... I've seen that, you know, there were seven chosen deacons to be served, uh, to serve the, the, the church. So, uh, verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, the one who was the first martyr, and Philip, Procrus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte, proselyte from Antioch. This Nicholas proselyte from Antioch, as I explained to you last time, is not the one from whom Nicolaitans have got their name, brethren. This was Nicholas was obviously a faithful, a faithful deacon. The Nicholas, the other Nicholas, a bishop from Samaria, was the one occultist with Simon Magus, who was in Antioch, and then the apostle Peter went there to counter them and uh, push out their poison. So we have these interestingly enough among these names, brethren. I have to mention something also in a passing comment when in Acts chapter eight you find a great persecution against the church after the martyrdom of Stephen. We don't really find the uh, the number of those who were murdered in Jerusalem. But I remember in the Fox's Book of Martyrs that it says that that great persecution, in that great persecution, 2,000 believers in Jerusalem were killed. Along with this Deacon uh, Nicanor, is he mentioned somewhere here? Deacon, yes, Deacon Nicanor, this one that is mentioned here. So he was murdered along with 2,000 believers. And all the rest were scattered all over the place except for the Apostle, which he says, how it says, how it is put in uh, Acts chapter 8. So 2,000 brethren, that was the first martyrdom. And let me, let me again point out, brethren, that the first martyrs were all the Jews. And that the first martyrdom of the saints occurred in Jerusalem, brethren. And it is described in few words, very few words, in the Acts chapter 8. So sometimes the secular history helps us put into perspective some things. Because if there were 5,000 who were converted around the day of first fruits, as you know, then that means that the church was almost basically decimated by those who sealed their faith with their own blood. Eusebius, in his famous church history, says that Luke, by birth in Antiochian, Antiochian and by profession was a physician, for was for long periods a companion of the Apostle Paul. That's what he says, and he is right. Now Luke, as we have just read in Eusebius' account, became a companion of Paul. And Luke was not always an eyewitness of events. Of course, because, you know, in Luke, in his Gospel, Luke 1, and the first two verses, we read that he wrote the Gospel, you know, from documents and facts related to him from the apostles themselves. Because he says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So, however, when he joined Paul, he became an eyewitness when, together with Paul, he had different experiences. For example, in Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Luke may have met Paul when he came to Antioch, because Paul was on his journeys, and perhaps that's how the two met. That's in Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. The Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The first they were called the followers of Christ in Antioch. Now, if you read also in Acts from chapter 1 through chapter 16, Luke writes in the third person. And in Acts... 16 verse 8 he joins Paul that would be about 50 AD 16 8 it says so passing by Misha they came down to Troas and then a vision appeared to Paul in the night a man from Macedonia now interestingly enough in verse 7 it says they after they had come to Mysia they tried to go to Bithynia but the spirit did not permit them however in verse 10 here it changes to we 
Now after he had seen the vision immediately we sought to go to Mas we sought to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord has had ruled us to preach the gospel to them. So basically they changes to we. And in verses 6 and 7 that is that vision which moved Paul to go over to Europe it says now when they had gone through Phrygia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Well, brethren, when the Paul saw the vision, which is in verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, when Paul saw the vision, some say it was actually a vision of Luke. Because many felt that Luke was a Macedonian by, you know, by his origin. However, in verse 12, And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. So they went to Philippi, which was named after the uh, father of Alexander the Great, after his father Philip. So Luke obviously stayed with Paul, and as the... As the historical accounts tell us, he served the church five and a half years in Philippi. And then in uh, chapter 17, verse, verse 1, it's back today. Now when they had passed through Amphi Amph Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then in Acts chapter 20, he rejoined Paul in 55 AD, after serving at Philippi, obviously. Acts 20 verse 1, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over to the region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sell, sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so Patria of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy and Tychians and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Waited for us, for them, for Luke to join the Apostle Paul. And then of course from Acts chapter 27 when Paul was arrested. Basically Luke was Paul's com companion in arrest. Again as I said brethren Luke was a loyal faithful servant. All Asia has deserted me, the Apostle Paul pleaded in his letter to Timothy, all Asia brethren except for one, only Luke has remained with me. So Luke accepted Paul's leadership without questioning. He did so even after Paul rejected his advice that he not go to Rome and it was proven to be good advice. Well brethren, people of God make mistakes. And if you ever want to be in the uh, perfect church of God, please find me there where is the perfect church of God and I would be very glad to go there and join with you. But you can certainly make sure that if there was a perfect church of God, brethren, none of us would be part of it. <laughs> as sure as, as it is. So even Paul made mistakes, brethren, other people made mistakes. Sometimes we hear good advice and we just make mistakes. But as for Luke, Luke remained faithful nevertheless and he probably served Paul in bolstering his frail health. In 2 Timothy 4.11, we read that Luke stayed with him in danger and deprivation. What a, an example of loyalty, brethren. What an example of loyalty. And I remember from the forum communication, it was one of you who uh, some time ago, as far as I remember, wrote, I wish I could sacrifice for the brethren. We need to be serving one another. We need to be willing to do this, that, and the other for one another. Yes, brethren, I hope that the Spirit of God will form such a character in us to be faithful to the end, to be so loyal as Luke was. Now, as far as style of the book of Acts, Luke was, as you can see, well-educated as a physician. His education level was high. Now, Hebrews is the most eloquent style in the New Testament Acts. Now, Acts is also, you know, the Hebrew is the most eloquent and the most clear and the most literate exactly in the book of Acts. So Luke is also a master storyteller because Acts tell, tells a story better than any other and Acts is written in the same style as the Septuag Septuagint. The style is changed from Luke to Acts because, you know, the Gospel was written in one style, the Acts in another because there was a different audience. 
because you know Luke's writing is self-facing because he does not mention himself so Acts is written in plain chronological order remember we read in Luke chapter 1 verse 3 in order he was writing in order primarily you know he was writing everything in order and that's how he was relating the story as well in the book of Acts perhaps it would be of a value to just read to you a quote from email Blakelock who writes in the Zondervan encyclopedia quote the book in short is the writing of one who had command of his material, who knew what he wished most to say, who could stress with patience and repletion his most significant reports, and could cut and abbreviate ruthlessly when his main purpose was not directly furthered by the narrative. Such decisiveness requires a clarity of mind and a literary ability of no mean order. Now to the question, when was it written, brethren? There are three possible dates, and only one is logical. I'll mention these three because perhaps you will encounter some of those, and uh, you need to be able to discern whether they're true or not. Well, the first possible date is uh, the year 150 to 130. Now, this would eliminate Luke as the author if it was written later than Paul's death, because Paul, I'll remind you, was beheaded by Acts, his head was beheaded in Rome in uh, according to tradition in 67 AD so if the book was written you know this late this would eliminate Luke as the author if it was written later than Paul's death the historian would have been remiss for not including the rest of the story of the result of the trial of Paul's later works his arrest and conviction so therefore this should be ruled out now the second possibility is the year 80 to 95 now, I'll just remind you to keep in mind that the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, as well as the Jerusalem itself, were destroyed in 70 AD. So, such a significant event, certainly, you might say, well, that, that would not be something that the book of Acts could skip to inform us about. So, the book, you know, reflects a Rome, basically. The book of Acts reflects a Rome that is free from the fierce hostility after Nero's fire and the extreme persecution that occurred after 64 AD. So there would be no need to detail Gentiles' acceptance into the church if it were this late and the Jews had their nation destroyed and peoples scattered. So therefore, we can also rule out the uh, year 80 to 95. Now the third possibility is probably the one that would make most sense it will be year 64 to 66 well you see the book of acts has no reference to the destruction of the temple in 70 a.d none of the accounts could have been written much later than when the events occurred for them to have been so clear and accurate so the book ends abruptly with paul in prison if it were written any later than this it would probably refer to other earlier church writings so the most logical date is this 64 to 66 that's the period that we can say that the book of acts was written now of course as i said everything written in the book of god is in the word of god is with a purpose now what is the purpose of the book well we you know tend to get out of a book or movie what we expect and we'll see in them what other others tell us is there and that is why it is always so important to read the preface of a book what was the author's intent? Every writer has a purpose or motive or point of view. There is always a primary message to any book or motive. So, what did Luke want to say in the book of Acts? Well, brethren, we can say the two possible things he wanted to tell us. Luke was a historian and he wanted to give permanence to these extraordinary events that were taking place and of which he was a part. The events of Acts were something big. Truly something big, brethren. Think about that. The first New Testament Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the first encounter by the apostles with the uh, main pagan high priest in Samaria. What else? Well, the conversion of the Gentiles, Cornelius and his house full of his friends and relatives. Well, frankly, it doesn't say how many people were there, but it says that the house was big. 
And I'm just speculating. This is not a doctrine. Again, this is my speculation. Perhaps, brethren, there were 120 Gentiles. Just to reflect what happened in Jerusalem. Remember, there were 120 disciples of Christ who received the Holy Spirit. And, interestingly enough, if you think about who those might be, there was his mother, Mary, there were his brothers as well. And there were his cousins. Because John and James, the sons of Zebedee, were obviously his cousins. So, perhaps there was Elizabeth and uh, Zacharias as well. We don't know. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't tell us what was the uh, who composed those 120. It's interesting to think about that sometimes. <laughs> and one day we will know the truth. We don't know how many people actually were in Cornelius' house, but obviously the house was big, and it says it was full of people. So Luke was historian. He wanted to record these big events for us, brethren. And the second thing is he sensed that this movement would change history. He probably felt compelled to commit. You know those 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 events to paper so what did god want to say in the book of acts well luke may not have even ever thought that what he was writing was to be a permanent part of the scriptures however god did know and he inspired what was included so luke may have had a purpose but god has his own purpose that are now also evident in the book of acts now there are seven reasons for the book of acts seven reasons you know one of those reasons was to show how the gospel went to the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, interestingly enough, Brendan, there are six sections that each end with a progress report. This is interesting now. From Acts 1 and through chapter 6, verse 7, the gospel grew but was confined primarily to Jerusalem. From Acts 6, 8... Through chapter 9, verse 31, the gospel then spread through the promised land and into Samaria. From Acts 9, 32, through chapters 12, 24, it spread to Antioch in Syria, and the Gentiles were included. Gentiles meaning Cornelius. Then from Acts 12, 25, through chapter 16, 5, it extended to Asia Minor, to modern Turkey and Galatia. From Acts 16.6 6 through chapter 19.20, it spread all over Europe, including cities such as Corinth and Ephesus. From Acts 19.21 through chapter 28, verse 31, it finally spread to the very capital of Imperial Rome. And all these brethren took 30 years to occur. Isn't that amazing? You've heard me very often say, how in the last 30 years, so many of the precious knowledge that we had, used to have, should have had, has been lost. So it took 40 years, you see, to build and spread the gospel. And it took, it seems, 40 years of the, the, big, the, the huge apostasy of 1995 to dismantle so much of the truth. But yes, we will restore it. We shall, brethren, restore it. Because we are a Philadelphia remnant and we have to restore all that precious truth to our knowledge and awareness. The other purpose might be better to show the Gentiles that the Gentiles were accepted into God's church. And as of recently, you know, we have been underlining the importance of including the number of the Gentiles. We've been quoting Romans. And yes, to my knowledge, I don't know of any church of God out there who has been publishing preaching, spreading the gospel in more languages than the continued Church of God. When I say languages, I also include dialects, various you know, tribal dialects, local dialects, national dialects, whatever. That's how it should be, brethren. That's how it should have been all the time. So the purpose of the Acts could have been to show the Gentiles were accepted because, you know, the household of God passed from national, Jewish, to international. And also, as you know, in Acts chapter 10, I've already referred to him. That's Cornelius. Let's go there. 10 verse 28. Acts 10 verse 28. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful, Peter speaking to Cornelius, how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That was the purpose of his vision in Acts 10. 
it's not about the meat and unclean meat. No, no, no. The Jewish people had always, and even to this day, they considered non-Jewish people to be unclean, ritually unclean. But God showed in a vision, dramatic vision to Peter, that it, you know, no person is to be unclean. The Holy Spirit I'm giving to all those who are willing to obey me, basically. That was the message. And Peter got it. So the first Gentile who was not first a Jewish proselyte is baptized in Acts chapter 10. So before this, brethren, there were two kinds of converts. The first was proselyte, proselyte of the gate, meaning circumcised. And the second was called a God-fearer. You'll find those Greeks who are God-fearers in the book of Acts because these believed in the God for, of the Jews and they kept the commandments but did not go all the way and be circumcised. You find it exactly in Thessalonica when the Apostle Paul went with his companions. Plenty of those Greek God-fearers, not a small number of women, followed him and believed in him. And the Jewish crowd was stirred up with envy and with rage. That's in uh, Acts chapter 17. Now also in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11, Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, that is something to be marked because obviously much of the book of Acts is dedicated to the service of the, of the apostle Paul. That will be in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11, which is of course another proof we mentioned in Serbian that the Gentile city of Rome could never have a Jewish bishop, first bishop. To which I was, Apostle Paul says to Timothy, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, or the apostle to the Gentiles. And then also in Acts chapter 15, there was a major decision from headquarters what to require of the Gentile converts. So there was a famous conference in Jerusalem. Also, I said there will, be, there will be six major points, purposes why the book of Acts was uh, written. One of, the, one of the reasons might be to expose the beginnings of a false Christianity. Now, this now brings to home, brethren, the messages we have had about the Gnostics and the message we had about Simon Magus and his heretics, Nicolaitans, Balaamites, the female part of his system called Jezebel to the church of Thyatira in the book of Revelation. I'm hoping that from after that message, I'm, I, I'm hoping that uh, we have a better grasp of the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation was primarily addressed to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And I've learned from our deacon, he said he had got some other little details he wanted to add, so we'll be very happy to hear few more things about that which will again clarify and sharpen our focus so in acts chapter 8 i won't go there to read you because we already read that from verse 9 through 25 simon magus is identified and i'll remind you he's called in the church history the father of all heresies the main heresy was his mishmash motley crew whatever you want to call his blend of religious ideas, beliefs, and thoughts. The blend from Babylonian, Persian, and other traditions, all the pagan traditions, with the New Testament terminology. And that became what is today called Christianity. Or as <laughs> I love that term, or churchianity, basically. What these churches are preaching with the name Christian has nothing to do with Christ, which means the Messiah. Now in 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 24, you remember we referred to that scripture, Samaritans were Persian people transported to Israel during the Assyrian captivity. So the northern part of the promised land, Samaria, was basically populated by the five pagan tribes who were transported by the Assyrians. And many of these were descendants of Abraham, but they mixed the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, with the Babylonian mysteries, mystery religions, you know. Holy mysteries, as you will find them in today's main churches. Babylon mystery the great. Now Simon Magus mixed Babylonian mysteries with Christian teaching. And Simon Magus was teaching up in Rome about 15 years before Paul arrived. So you can just imagine how much of his poison 
was as the apostle peter prophesied in chapter in books chapter 8 how much of this poison was spread throughout the city of rome there might be another purpose for the book of acts brethren to show that christianity was a law-abiding religion throughout the empire and not a threat to rome because paul and his teachings were made to appear as a threat to rome in acts chapter 17 verse 5 through 7 i think that's about thessalonians when they were in thessaloniki that's right there was a huge synagogue of jews verse 5 but the jews who were not persuaded becoming envious took some of the evil men why were they envious brethren because paul gained much attention among those god fears and among also various jews so they took those who were envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of jason and sought to bring them out to the people but when they did not find them they dragged jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out these who have turned the world upside down have come here too jason has harbored them and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of caesar saying there is another king jesus so envious jews brought the charge of another king obviously with the same intent that these that the paul and his companions be all arrested and stopped and prevented from further preaching in chapter 18 they were now in corinth they were charged with teaching people to worship contrary to law at 18 verse 12 when the galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. However, thankfully, this 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 man Galileo obviously was uh, was man who was not easily swayed by the Jewish mob, so he took even Paul in some way of protection. In Acts chapter 24, Paul was charged and his companions with sedition. Could you believe that? <laughs> Brethren, they are going to charge us with all this, one way or the other. Remember my sermon about 45 days before going to the place of safety? Well, even before that, they might charge us with things like sedition. 24 verse 5. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes sect or cult in some translations it mean it says sedition so act the book of acts then ends, uh, ends with paul in prison for such charges and acts in general part defends paul the church and the teachings of the church i also have to bring to your attention that church members were shown to be good citizens i'm not going to read the scriptures but i'll just tell you in acts chapter 18 verse 13 and 14 there was found no wickedness in them in acts 19 verse 37 paul did not rob temples or blaspheme others and in acts 23 verse 29 they did nothing worthy of bonds so we are to follow the same example and uh, we have been patiently enduring as good citizens all these tough measures about coronavirus whether they're justified or not However, I mentioned to you already that Paul had a good relationship with Rome. Again, Paul, not Peter. I'll, again, I'll just give you several examples without going into the... You can check them later in your personal study. In Acts chapter 13, verse 12, Sergius, the governor, be becomes a Christian. In Acts 18, verse 12, Galileo, who we just mentioned, was indifferent to accusations against the church. In Acts 16, verse 35, Officials had to apologize for wrongs against the church. In Acts 19, verse 31, many chief officials were Paul's friends. And finally, if you see Acts 28, the Apostle Paul taught two years and no one forbid him when he was arrested in Rome. So this showed that the church and its teachings were not a threat to anyone. That might have been a purpose of luke's writing of the book of acts now some have suggested that acts is a trial document why because so much of it contains a defense of christianity and the church that it might be just that it is its main purpose and also the book abruptly ends with paul waiting for trial so the fact that it never goes on to show the result or any other works may indicate that it had served its purpose of defense of paul and that was and that was all it was intended to do there might have been another purpose, brethren, to show how God handled many first-time events. 
And when I say that, I think that you and I can very well identify with that. I'll just enumerate them to you. Acts chapter 2, first time the Holy Spirit was given to man. Also in the same chapter, the first tongues given. Well, obviously, there's a purpose why those tongues were given. Now, don't mistake, don't take me wrong. The modern Pentecostal movement is demonic. It has nothing to do with the original Church of God. We don't have those tongues because, obviously, there is no reason for them to be exist. Perhaps, we don't know, perhaps God will restore some of that gifts. We don't know. Perhaps he would. For his purpose and for the sake of preaching the gospel, brethren, only for that, not for us to boast and think, oh, look how great Christian we are, we can speak in tongues. But anyway, Acts 2, first tongues given. Acts 6, first time deacons ordained. I just enumerated that. We just read their names a few minutes ago. Acts 8, first time persecution is experienced. That is that great persecution after Stephen was martyred. Also in the same very chapter, Acts 8, first time heresy develops. In Acts 15, verse 37, first time conflict of personalities occurred before, between Barnabas and Paul. In Acts 14, verse 23, first time field churches are raised up. And in Acts 15, first conference to decide matters was held. So just to record all those firsts. Now, in this year, we've done first time several things, including, <laughs> as far as I know, the first counseling for baptism over Skype, you see. So we can, you can just analyze how many firsts we have had this year, brethren, and then you might realize why the book of Acts doesn't end with the usual word, Amen. It remained to be added more and more. Also, one of the purpose might be to link the Gospels to the Epistles, because without the Acts, the Epistles of Paul would not be accepted by the Church. We also have in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, we basically see that it takes up where the Gospel leaves off. Let's read that. To remind us, Acts chapter 1, 1, the former account I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now it also shows the beginning of the church and Peter's primacy. Because in Acts chapter 2, in verse 14 and beyond, we have the first sermon given by Peter. In Acts chapter 3, as you remember that man who was be, uh, in front of the temple begging, in Acts chapter 3, Peter heals publicly. And then in Acts 4, the Jerusalem officials are trying to ban Peter and John from preaching. So Peter becomes the spokesman to the Jews. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, after he healed that man. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole this is the stone which was rejected by the builders by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we might be saved. Then also in Acts chapter 8 through verse through chapter 13, that is, it shows Paul's conversion and the authority of his apostleship. In Acts 15, it shows Paul subjecting himself to the church government. And also he shows his links to Peter and the rest of the Jerusalem. And then, as we have just read in Acts 17, in Thessalonica in, in 18 verse 1 Acts 18 verse 1 in Corinth and 19 verse 1 it shows Paul establishing the churches that the later epistles will be written to verse 1 of chapter 19 was uh, is actually referring to the church of Ephesus finally brethren another purpose for the book of Acts might be that it was to set the example for the succeeding years of the church of the tremendous faith and courage of the apostle paul because if you analyze what is written in that book in several verses we see in acts 9 verse 15 that he was a chosen vessel of god in the same chapter verse 6 once he knew god's will he was in complete submission to it and paul also showed great boldness when facing opposition and frankly I wish I could be bold as much as he was. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
verse 23 to 27, he suffered great physical abuse for his faith. In Acts 16, verse 23, he endured beatings. In Acts 14, verses 19 and 20, he suffered stoning and perhaps died. In Acts 13, verse 50, he was thrown out of the city by the Jews. And in Acts 14, verse 5, he was attacked by the Gentiles and countrymen. And yet, in Acts 20, verse 17 through, 20, through 35, in the face of possible death, his concern was not for himself, but for the churches. You remember in that Acts 20, is his famous warning to all the elders gathered at Ephesus, that after his departure, grievous wolves would come in, and even from some of those that he ordained, there will be people speaking, teaching perverse things. Now, brethren, in this context, I want to finish by basically telling you something important. The world had to be prepared for the events of the book of Acts. Because the story of the book of Acts is the spread of true Christianity within the confines of the Roman Empire. So Luke wanted to write down what he experienced because he felt that he was a part of something very big. So he probably didn't even realize just how big it was. And in a similar way, we probably don't realize fully today the importance of what we are doing. Perhaps one of these days when we stop and just turn around and say, what have we done in the last year? We'll say, oh, well. Because it took over 30 years, as you have seen, to spread the gospel through the empire. When it comes to the last century, during the Philadelphia church era, it took about 50 years for the gospel to go worldwide in our time. From the time of 30s until the 80s when the death of, of Herbert Armstrong it took about 50 years, half a century. Well, however, brethren, it took over 4,000 years to set the stage. Well, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, well, God was obviously waiting until everything was ready. Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Well, he sent his son, he was born when, brethren? When the fourth great prophesied empire was ruling the world during the Roman Empire. Now, when everything was ready, you might answer, you might ask actually, why Jesus Christ did not appear ten minutes after Adam sinned? Why Jesus Christ didn't give the Holy Spirit, why God didn't give the Holy Spirit instead of the law at Sinai? Why not start the church then and go out to the world? Well, brethren, it didn't happen. Everything happens in God's time. And as I say this, I'm fully aware that one of my greatest problems, and probably yours, is the lack of patience. It all had to happen at the right time. God controlled everything so that all factors were in place before he sent his son all was in place before he sent the holy spirit and before he started his church and before he allowed the gospel to be preached to the civilized world you'll remember daniel's dream daniel's dream helps us to understand you I'll, we won't be reading that but you should know that in daniel chapter 2 verse 35 through 45 32 through 45 there was to be you know four successive kingdoms and each kingdom contributed something necessary to what had to be in place before had to be in place first before Christ could come and the gospel to go out. Well, Babylon was the head, head of gold. Persia was the chest of silver. Greece was the belly of brass. Rome was the legs of iron and clay. Well, you notice obviously that there is a descending order. It is, brethren, as if the character of kingdoms has been decreasing each era. However, certainly the best quality is given to Babylon. And the rest are inferior in quality, but stronger militarily. So what will be this last resurrection of the Roman Empire? It will have a huge, mighty European army, brethren. Remember, in Revelation 13, I think it's verse 3, when people worship the beast and say, Who is like the beast and who can wake war with him? Which means, who can defeat this great army of the beast, brethren? Just like people in Anglo-Saxon world today worship their own armies. <laughs> the same will happen in Europe. Europe doesn't have, United Europe still doesn't have its own army. One of these days, it will be reality. 
Many of my kinsmen here don't believe that. But I've been telling them for years, it's going to be a reality. You'll see it with your own eyes. Who should be yet another proof that we've been telling you the truth all along. So the kingdom of Babylon developed over a vast period, brethren, and the civilization started on the Tigris and Euphrates River. A major step was food production rather than gathering. So, you know, instead of being nomads, people just led, they, they were having a settled life, and this led to building cities. And then also a system of writing, cuneiform, developed, and Babylon first became important about 2000 before Christ. You are, I'm certain that you've heard of Hammurabi, famous Hammurabi. He forged a civilization in Babylon, and this civilization produced the first forms of writing, a set of laws, studies in mathematics, astronomy, and other sciences. Brethren, Babylon developed 360 degree circle. It also developed 60 minute hour. It understood fractions, squares, square roots, and could predict eclipses of the sun and moon. They built networks of canals to carry water from the river, and industry and trade developed. So that's what was the importance of Babylon. However, the Assyrians contributed in shaping Babylon, because Assyrians were a war-making machine. They were the first power to have a standing army. One of the one of their rulers, Assyrian rulers, Tiglath. Pilesar the third and Sargon the second, they were mighty warriors that subdued the smaller loose kingdoms to forge an empire. They are the ones who submit who basically defeated the ten tribes of Israel. So these two, they had yeah, the Assyrians in general, they had the first system set up to administer a vast empire. The closer provinces were governed by Assyrian officials, the outlying areas became dependent states. They had royal roads and mounted messengers to bring immediate word of any unrest of rebellion. Now, interestingly enough, in the history of Israel, one of these days we'll probably be covering that, you can see the strategy of the Assyrian Empire, brethren. They conquered the, st they conquered the state. They set up a vassal state. They then set up a subject king. They exacted tribute. They would pull out their troops. If the vassal state rebelled, well, they set up a new king, they seized some of the territory, and they deported some of the people. If the vassal kings rebelled again, they took over all the territory, they deported all the people except a few to teach the new settlers about the land, and they resettled different people in the land. Well, as I see this, if you know anything about Hitler's plan about the, for the East and for the Slavic people and about Europe, this is better than exactly the copy of what Hitler had in mind. And all of this worked very well because, you know, the defeated nations could not coordinate a revolt. Residents concerned were concerned with survival in new land, new residents. No longer was a purpose, you know, in revolt because land is not yours and you could not go back to homeland if it was occupied by others. <laughs> Perfect plan, isn't it? Now, the Bible records this strategy, brethren. God used the Assyrians to punish Israel, as you know. And we'll do it again. So in 2 Kings chapter 15, there was an example of the stage 1, then example of stage 2. In 2 Kings 7, 17, there was an example of stage 3. And also in 2 Kings 17 verse 24, it brought in others to replace the deported, those deported ones, those who were of the ten tribes of Israel. Now, you may wonder, why is Assyria not mentioned in Daniel's dream? Well, brethren, perhaps because they were simply before his time, also, that Babylon was gold indicates that God did not rank Assyria higher. It may be also that God did not mention them because they were such a brutal and barbaric people. And they kept an empire in line by fear through atrocity and terrorism. Brethren, their modern descendants are nothing different from them, brethren. And I realize because your Anglo-Saxon people, you, your nations have never been occupied by those people that you don't realize. How brutal and ruthless and barbaric they are, brethren. How of a different mindset they are. We here from Serbia will keep warning you all the time about that because we have suffered at their hands twice in the last century. And if anyone rebelled, the area suffered brutal retaliation. There were bloody sieges that ended in disease and starvation. Surrender only resulted in systematic torture and slaughter. They would leave forests of impaled prisoners or piles of severed heads to signal their victories. Brethren, brutal Assyrians.
Yes, they're coming again to punish the rebellious house of Israel, which is rebelling against God today. An account of how Ashurbanipal, one of their kings, dealt with the Babylonian people gives a good example of this point. I'm quoting him. I tore out the tongues of these whose slanderous mouth had uttered blasphemies against my god Ashur and had plotted against me his God-fearing prince. I defeated them completely. The others I smashed alive with the very same statues of protective deities. I fed their corpses cut into small pieces to dogs, pigs, zebu, zebu birds, vultures, the birds of the sky and also to the fish of the ocean. After I had performed this, I removed the corpses of those whom the pestilence had felt, whose leftovers after the dogs and pigs had fed on them were obstructing the streets. End of the quote. Do you think that they have changed, brethren? No, they haven't. And I'm afraid, brethren, that many people in the Anglo-Saxon world have no idea how horrible and awful will be the Great Tribulation. Many people in the churches of God have no clue who the Germans are and how awful the Great Tribulation would be at their hands. And there is nobody, it seems, out there in America to tell them that. Well, I'm here from Europe telling you that. I'm giving you this account, a witness from a nation which suffered twice at the hands of Germans. And in a sense, he's suffering the third time now because after bombing our country in 1999, they are now partitioning our country and they're taking away a big part, a big chunk of our territory, brethren. Systematically, ruthlessly, and with all you know, with all the details how the Germans do it. Pedantly. They're very pedant people. Even when they commit genocide. Now back to Babylon. Rabbi Nebopalasar Nebop was uh, one of the rulers. And the Medes, they marched against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. They captured the capital of Assyria, burned it to the ground. You may wonder why. What about Well, because this is how the Assyrians were. In 6005, before Christ... Nebopola Palasar defeated the Egyptians and took Carchemish. That battle is recorded in the Bible. He also died in this year. And his son Nebuchadnezzar, who we all know from the Bible, took over. And Nebuchadnezzar initiated several attacks on Judah and set, sent many more captives to Babylon. Now, Babylonian strategy was the one that copied the Assyrian technique. However, they improved the system by selecting talented foreigners and used them in their government and naturalized them. That's how Daniel became a librarian on the court of at the palace of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And you find how they naturalized people and took, you know, the talented for in Daniel chapter 1 in seven first seven verses. They gave the naturalized name Chaldean. They gave positions in the palace and Daniel was able to rise even to second in power. And Babylon greatly expanded the size of the empire. The empire was not so brutal under Nebuchadnezzar. There is something also in that vision, brethren, in Daniel chapter 7 verse 4, which I need, which I need to bring your attention to. And please, please know this. This is a detail that you might have missed. When it speaks about the first beast, seven, Daniel 7, 4, the first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings, brethren, eagle's wings. I'm asking you, which nation today has an eagle as its, as its national symbol, brethren? It is Germany and Austria. So lion with wing, wings, this equals Assyrian's, Assyrian influence. However, when we see later in the verse, I watched till wing, its wings were plucked off. So the Assyrian Empire was destroyed. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. This meant it means that the empire became more humane. That was the empire of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. So once he felt secure, Nebuchadnezzar, he devoted much time to cultural pursuits and reconstruction. He made his capital the most notable capital in the world. He constructed new canals and navigable waterways. He erected magnificent buildings and extensive parks. The city occupied an area of about 200 square miles. 
and it is famous for the seventh wonder of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So brethren, you see contribution was that the Babylonian and Assyrian civilization was the first real world ruling civilization. He had a standing army and a means to administer the empire. He had a system of communication and record keeping. That's what was then, you know, succeeding and uh, successively uh, inherited by other empires. The second was the Persian. The third was the famous Greco, Gre Greco, uh, Grecian or Greece empire. And finally came the inheritor of all of them, the Roman Empire into which Jesus Christ was born. And within the confines of the Roman Empire, brethren, this church, the first original church of which we are continuation, was incepted. We will continue with this review of the book of Acts next Sabbath.